Hermo, is there is there an analogy with Nigeria there? I think I think I think is it, it runs across most of Africa, right? You have the old guard, right? Systems that prop these leaders in place because even though these leaders make decisions, you know, to resist the revolution, you need the uh, you, I don't know if you compromise. You know, the collaboration of certain figures within the army. You know, you need um, certain certain power structures to be in place. Look at Obasanjo, for example. He had Ali Yugusa and the security advisor and the old Northern Bloc. You know, look at Buhari. He also has the support system. You know, so you know that, that. And this is again what we talk about: survival of the fattest. Those at the top of the pyramid. Uh, you know, you can pluck one person off. You know, the changing face, the face of the pyramid is the president. We take that guy off, and then there's always someone to replace him. It's like a um, what, what's what's the, that three-headed dog at the gates of hell? They cut off one head and Severus. Severus, yeah, Severus. Yes, you know, yeah. you cut off one head, and then another head tries to replace. It. You know, mm. the structure is firmly ingrained. Those people at the top are going to keep staying. You know, they, they'll stay the same in order to protect. You know, um, rents in order to enable rents to keep coming in. Yeah. So you take off the face, you know, and then you put another one. It's like Nike. Nike is always having new models to promote its brand. You know, mm. if one one um, celebrity goes off for a scandal or something else, you know, they pick, pick another to replace. Nike is still Nike. You wear the shoes. You know, the face you associate is this face at such a period of time. Simple. The, the many-headed Hydra of Nike. We've still not ruled out Nike sponsoring this podcast, though. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. if you're listening, Nike, we're, yeah, we're here's a chance mar- to do some brand management. We're still in the market for that. Um, but, but Patrick, let, I mean, let's talk about Libya. What, mm. what exactly has been going on the last 48 hours? Well, it, it, it's been a very dramatic week because um, General Khalifa Hefta, I mean, who advisedly calls himself general, a lot of people say he's not a general at all, has. Um, massed his his uh, forces uh, from the east and is marching on Tripoli. And uh, in fact, l- late on Friday, 5th of April, we heard the news that uh, there's fighting in some villages just south of Tripoli. Uh, and his target is Prime Minister Sarai al-Sadraj's government, which had uh, some conditional UN backing. And indeed, the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres was in Tripoli this week and he cautioned against any attempt to get a political settlement by force. He really tried to send the message to have to to back off. Um, And of course, there are a lot of people who think that um, Russia and Egypt and those backers of Haftar uh, saying, well, look, the region's in chaos. You know, the Algerians have, have just risen up and they've overthrown Bouteflika. So now's the time to seize the moment, grab power and uh, shore up our base. So what is kind of interesting as a result of that is that one of Hefta's other backers in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, put out a statement uh, midday on Friday uh, cautioning uh, Libyans against any violent resolution of their political dispute, more or less without naming Hafter, saying, well, actually, you know, we don't agree with this, uh, with this fight. Uh, Russia then, after that, put out its own statement uh, calling on Libyans not to redu- uh, resort to violence, to settle their dispute. Again, very carefully refusing to name sides in the fight. And it's still very strongly thought that uh, Russia and Egypt and the UAE are backing Haftar and that he would not have been emboldened to make this push for the capital without their support. In fact, it's unthinkable because he doesn't have the resources to do it. So you're left with a big question of who is behind Haftar and what happens if he gets to the capital. It's by no means certain that he's going to win this, this battle but what is certain is a lot of uh, people, mostly innocents, are going to die in the crossfire as he as he tries. So it, it's a it's a pretty bad moment for Libya. It probably means the end of this sort of UN pro- peace process is over. It means that the African Union conference about uh, to f- uh, kind of negotiate some new political path for Libya isn't now going to happen. So, uh, in, in, in a sense, the political process in Libya has been put on hold. 
uh, as long as Hafter continues this offensive. And nobody seems to be, apart from Guterres at the UN, seems to be able to stand up and say, pack it up, you have no right to do this, you're just, uh, you're just trying to grab territory without getting into political negotiations, and that should be what you're trying to do. You should solve this through some sort of political means. And Gutierrez just just today, I think, was, you know, quoted as saying he was, you know, very, very, you know, gravely concerned about the situation, and, and he didn't didn't seem to be holding out a lot of hope either. Um, but but do you think in this era of you know, the retreat from internationalism, um, and especially America, uh, who who otherwise would have a you know a relatively big say in in Egypt's affairs simply because it gives billions of dollars mm. in aid each each year, military aid. Mm. Um, it, it, if uh, if if Egypt is backing Haftar, mm. do you think America is just mute in the same way as America is now mute in Syria? I think there's certain certain American officials are monitoring it. They've uh, they've come up with various very bland formulations. And I think there's a there's a sense in which they're subcontracting diplomacy to re- regional hegemons. And uh, Abdul Fattah el Sisi in Egypt is one of their regional hegemons. And uh, the current U.S. administration doesn't seem at all bothered about his heinous human rights record. Uh, doesn't seem at all bothered by the fact that he seems to be backing uh, wanton aggression in Libya. Uh, There hasn't been any attempt to bring Haftar to heel from the Americans. So you've got to assume that they're they're giving the nod to El Sisi and they're giving the nod to Abu Dhabi just to go ahead with this. Uh, And uh, Russia likes it just fine. In a sense, for Russia, um, it's a lot less problematic than in Syria. Because in Syria, uh, Russia lined up with Iran and that ruffled uh, Saudi Arabia's feathers. Here they're lining up with Saudi, they're lining up with the UAE and Egypt, all their allies, and America isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to criticize anyone in, in that game. Those are all their key allies. So I think it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a sad moment, and uh, I think there's a deafening silence from the European Union at this moment. And after all, uh, both Emmanuel Macron of France and Matteo Salvini of Italy uh, were jousting uh, a few months ago about who who should fa- fashion Libya policy. And now you've got a complete breakdown of European Union Libya policy, and neither of them seems to be getting into the ring to discuss it. I know it is actually on the agenda. There's a G7 meeting in, uh, in northern France uh, this weekend, and it may be that then the EU members of the G- G7 will come out and make some sort of statement. But so far, we've heard very little from the EU on this. And I guess a statement will be um, will be quite late in the game, depending on where where Haftar has has deployed um, his forces. Uh, Libya, at one point, people were very worried it would be a, a sort of a, a rear base for Islamic State. Islamic State's obviously been largely crushed in in mm. Syria and northern Iraq. Um, with with Haftar getting back in control of big swaths of, of, of territory in the country. Does it make it more or less likely that that Islamic State or other Islamist militant groups will will target the country? I think, I mean, the strange thing about this current bout of fighting in Libya was, as you rightly say, you know, Libya was seen as the the kind of entrepot uh, for Islamic State in Africa. And uh, you've certainly seen um, an uptick of Islamic State activity in the Sahel and uh, from what we're seeing in Burkina Faso and northern Nigeria, Um, But largely, they seem to be largely absent from this fight because, in a sense, you've got the Siraj government and its its militia allies in places like Misrata and so on uh, on one side of the argument, and then you've got Haftar coming in from the east and Benghazi on the other. The Islamists don't seem to be um, playing a a big role in this particular round of fighting. It may be they've calculated their best bet is just to sort of pull back and just watch the other the other sides tear them each other apart and then maybe they can come in and, and, and structure and of course Libya is such a big country 
that a lot of those uh, Islamic State uh, militia type groups were down in the south anyway, positioned for a quick run across the, the border into the Sahel proper or just biding their time. So that may be what's happening. Um, I don't think it means to, um, by any means they'll have forgotten that ambition to try and win power in Libya. I mean, Libya is a very rich prize. It's biggest uh, oil and gas reserves in Africa, tiny population. Uh, there's a lot of money and a lot of power. And of course, sitting there on the southern side of the Mediterranean, very strategic position too. Let, let's just wrap this up by talking about um, Russia's relationship with Algeria, because, mm. you know, on you know, various social media mutterings, um, we've seen uh, Algerian people say, you know, this is, this is a sign that, that Russia is flexing its muscles and Russia really wants status quo in Algeria, mm. the pouvoir we were talking about earlier. Russia would rather deal with someone it, it, it already deals yeah. with already. Yeah, I mean, Russia Russia has been very assiduous in wooing the, the various liberation regimes uh, in, in Africa. As, as you mentioned earlier, Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, uh, and of, of course, Algeria. The relationship with Algeria is particularly tight. In fact, it's said that 80% of Russian arms sales to Africa have gone to the FLN government in Algeria. I mean, Algeria used to have mind-blowing foreign reserves of over 150 billion plus. They're down a lot after a lot of uh, populist spending, um, but they're still very close. Um, and uh, on Tuesday night on French tele television, you kept on seeing this recycled footage of Butef in, Butflika in Moscow standing shoulder to shoulder. They're about the same height almost. With, with Vladimir Putin, um, and it was this big moment for Algeria, cementing those historic ties. So Russia has a huge strategic interest in the future of uh, Algeria, and I think the last thing Russia wants to see is a popular revolution. Uh, at the same time, it wants, to, it wants to sit there and stand back and watch how things develop and watch, out, and watch who it's going to support. I mean, they, <clears throat> their tightest uh, ties are with the FLN. So presumably they will be backing whichever faction of the FLN comes out on top and is then able to recreate itself. Um, I, I think it's pretty unthinkable that uh, Ru the Ru Russia would uh, in any way want to connect itself to a, to a popular movement in, in somewhere like Algeria. <laughs> That's all for this week. Please do say hi on Twitter at The Africa Report. I'm at Nick Norbrook. We'd love you to rate the show and type sweet nothings about us to Apple or to Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.